Welcome to the readingroom.com Great Reads. Today I'm absolutely thrilled to introduce you to one of my favorite authors, Kate Atkinson. Kate has burst into a literary scene in 1995 with an amazing novel in which she is given us an unforgettable character of Ruby. She has created many books since and expanded her readership greatly when she started writing her mysteries and introduced her to Jackson Brody. Her new novel, which is a return to her original style of writing, Life After Life, will leave you spellbound with its originality, and you will find it also already on the short list for the Women's Prize of Fiction, and I venture to say you will probably see it on a few more awards. Kate, welcome to the reading room. Thank you. Kate, I'm a massive fan of your book. I absolutely oh, loved you. it. And I have to say that when I came to the end of experience of reading for life uh, after life, one of the first thing that uh, that happened, I started imagining in my head a conversation with you. Mm. And one of the first questions that came to my mind was if you had a chance to relive your life again as a writer, is there anything that you would have changed? Oh, that's such a difficult question. Um, I don't think so, because I started off writing as a kind of therapy, you know, the way you do. I started off teaching myself, because I come from an academic background, and I studied writing, and so I was fearful of starting off with amateurish stuff. I wrote for women's magazines, which is how I yeah. learnt how to write, I think. And then I started quite late, so perhaps I would have started earlier, or maybe not. I did lots of different jobs, lots of menial jobs. Mm. I got a writer's CV. I mean, at the time, I would have thought it was a very imperfect way of becoming a writer. But actually, in retrospect, I think I probably did it the right way for me, mm -hmm. I think. That's a very interesting question. Mm. I'll probably come up with a completely different answer when I've thought about that. Mm. Mm. And having said that, I'm going to lead into another question. It's kind of similar, but not exactly. Your book is full of death and dying, but for me, and I think for a lot of other readers, it is also a celebration of life. And I think that reading this book, I, a lot of us will come to the conclusion that one life might not be quite enough for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you had a chance to live your life again as one fictional character, who mm. would you choose and why? Oh, Elizabeth Bennet, because <laughs> I think she's just the most perfect character in fiction. I mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I had to choose between Pride and Prejudice and Persuasion, I'd probably say Persuasion has just more of that melancholy and, and just something else. But Pride and Prejudice is the perfect book in, a, in, in all ways. I mean, in its structure and its content, everything is, is united in such harmony. And Elizabeth Bennet is just, she's quite the proper heroine. She thinks for herself, but at the same time, she understands social rules. You know, she's entirely of her time, and yet she transcends time. So no, it would be Elizabeth Bennet. Mm. Um, life After Life is also, in my opinion, a perfect book for people that love reading fiction. You have given us a chance to live through a different versions of the same story, which I think is something that a lot of readers who read fiction do in their heads anyway. Mm -hmm. We kind of run our own versions of mm -hmm. it. So while reading it, I actually really started to think hard about people as readers, and do they have preferences of the kind of the endings that they really love in books? So if I was going to ask you, do you have your favorite kind of the endings of your most beloved books? What would these endings be? What do you like in the ending? What do I like in the endings of books? I like symphonic endings. Mm -hmm. I think, not because it's hard to, to finish a book, but because I think the beginning and the end are so the exciting bits of the book for me in a way. So I find it difficult just to come to a stop. I have an ending and then I have another ending and then I'll have another ending. That's what I mean by symphonic. I'm thinking of something mm -hmm. like Beethoven's Fifth where you kind of think it's finished and then it's not finished because it's you just want to give it as much as you can, I mm -hmm. think. I think particular yes, but not with this book so much because what I wanted to achieve with this book was that you feel that it's always February the 11th, 1910 in a snowstorm and Ursula Todd is always being born. And out there somewhere, she's still being born and it's still going on. So I had a much more circular thing. So in a way, I was trying not to end this book. Mm. I have to say, I'm going to try to sneak one more question because okay. there was one more thing that I kept thinking about as I was reading through your book. I was imagining you in your room, sitting at your desk, writing and looking at the massive chart on your side, if this, then this. If that, is that. 
how did you plot your book? It just seems so incredibly complex. Unbelievably, I keep it all in my head. Um, the minute I finished, it's gone from my head, and but I that's the way I, I see it. So I don't have trouble following those things. I mean, I do keep some notes just to make sure I do know where people are mm -hmm. and how old they are. But really, it's just, I know where everyone is really and where what's supposed to happen. Mm. So in my head, not anymore, gone at <laughs> the time, all there. Okay, thank you very much for thank that chance of this much, brief Anna. conversation. Thank I you. really enjoyed it. And I know that this is maybe hard for you to hear since mm -hmm. you are at the end of your big tour. But I have to say that there is a lot of readers that are already counting days to your next book. <laughs> Thank you. I know, it's hard. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.